how would you define a first generation cryptocurrency? If you want to take that first. I'll take that first. So right. first generation, as simple as I can make it, it's just the way blockchain transfers money from one party to another to the next. That's the purpose of Bitcoin, transferring money from party A to party B. And, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about the drawbacks of a first generation blockchain, but Bitcoin has its issues issues. You know, I am a Bitcoin fan, but Bitcoin has a lot of issues. And at the end of the day, what causes me to use a first generation blockchain versus just swiping my credit card or using Samsung Pay on my phone? Uh, there's not a lot of incentive for me to use Bitcoin versus traditional fiat, at least at the stage that we're at now. So that's probably the best explanation I have of a first generation blockchain. Yeah, I agree. It's simply a you know, peer to peer network, much like you described. It provides security. It provides an exchange of value. Pretty, pretty short and sweet. Sebastian, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think before we, we get into it, it kind of makes sense to put this all into perspective uh, with the pillars of Cardano. What is, is the project uh, Cardano based upon? What, what ideas are we, we trying to push? And those three things are scalability, sustainability, and inter interoperability. Interoperability, yeah. And so how, how will we define a first generation across these, right? So for sustainability, we're mostly talking about governance, right? And if we think about gen, first gen governance, I think Bitcoin is the perfect example, right? There is no governance, right? The protocol mostly just doesn't change. Nobody really wants to change it, right? There is no attempt to make a system to really have it change other than the Bitcoin improvement proposals. And so I would consider Bitcoin a, a good uh, first gen cryptocurrency in that regard. Right. The other one is for scalability. This is kind of a more gray area. We, we like to say, you know, uh, first generation cryptocurrency will be one that doesn't really scale. Right. It's, it's obviously hard to define really what that means. But if you if you think of it that way, you could say Bitcoin is the first generation cryptocurrency where we know that the a transaction per second really doesn't scale that well. It's you know limited to up to in best case. Uh, ten transactions per second, I think, and the, the costs of the transaction fees goes pretty high. And you can think of a lot of cryptocurrencies that come after Bitcoin as being either Gen 2, Gen 3, and how much they're able to scale uh, as there are more users joining the network. Yeah, perfect description, because basically what you described there with the scalability, sustainability, interoperability, those are the three properties that the first generation does not have. First generation has yeah. no governance. It's wild, wild west out there, right? I think. Yeah, and I would say also for the last one, the interoperability. Uh, for that one, you can think of Bitcoin as being Gen 0, or sorry, Gen 1, where for Bitcoin, it's just Bitcoin. There's no real communication with any other layer, right? You can think of stuff like a MasterCoin as having been an attempt to build a, a layered system on top of Bitcoin, but really these haven't really taken off. Right, you can think of in that way Ethereum as a second generation, in the sense that with Ethereum you have a lot of ERC twenty smart contracts and other platforms like this that try and either interface with the legacy world or have an attempt to interface with other blockchains through trusted bridges or trustless bridges. Okay, you know so, what? I'm glad you touched on trusted and trustless because those are some definitions. Trusted and trustless, permission to permissionless are all things, definitions that I think we should discuss on the program here. But right now we're talking about the second generation of blockchain in that context. Uh, so, yeah, second generation, that's where you have smart contracts that you mentioned. Um, it tries to It tries to bridge, how did you describe that? So, so for Ethereum, you can try and bridge either with the legacy world, right? There are some ERC-20 smart contracts that, for example, represent gold, right? Somebody claims that I have 100 grams of gold, and so I'll have 100 tokens, and then people can trade around these tokens that represent some gold stored somewhere. So you can use these ERC-20 smart contracts to be a bridge between either the legacy financial world or you can also use them to be a bridge between different blockchains. For example, one of the Ethereum Foundation funded projects is to create a bridge between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, uh, the regular, if you will. Uh, as people are going to hate me for calling it regular. That's that. 
pretend I didn't say that. Uh, but that, this called, project is the, called the, the Peace Bridge. Yeah, the Peace Bridge, right? And so this is their way of building a uh, connection between these two chains, right? And doing this kind of project doesn't really work with Bitcoin. It, it's doable. People have tried to do it before, but Bitcoin was not really designed with that in mind. And so it's, it's not uh, as easy to do. So I think it's safe to say that Ethereum as a second generation blockchain added, added the idea of putting assets on the blockchain in addition to money. And while Bitcoin was just strictly money, the idea of, like Sebastian was saying, putting gold or putting something tangible or even something intangible, a digital asset on, on the blockchain. For example, the CryptoKitties, it, it's not tangible, but it is an asset and it has value in some people's minds. But that is what Ethereum has done successfully. Well, let me just change that. Now, I don't know about successfully, but they've successfully brought assets into blockchain. I should change it to that. Yes. And uh, it, it was so hard. It's kind of hard to define. I had to go on Telegram and ask Ruslan. So I asked Ruslan, Ruslan, can I use your name? And he said yes. Uh, and said, how, you know, how do I figure out what is, what is a smart contract and what is a DAP? And now, of course, you have you could put assets in there and somehow also. And I needed his thorough explanation on how to describe the difference between a smart contract and a DAP. And of course, he sent me this really funny GIF or really funny picture that explains it. But you know, the smart contract is part of the gen second generation. So when you start talking smart contract, you're now on the second generation and above. Right. Right. Yeah. So I mean, so there's there's two ways that I think you could define second generation. Two main principles. Obviously, there was a, at some point a battle for who is Bitcoin 2.0, right? Ethereum definitely tried to market itself as Bitcoin 2.0, and I think it kind of won that in the sense that now it is considered the uh, Gen 2 blockchain. Uh, but we can imagine an alternative ver an alternative version of history. Where, for example, uh, Monero won the Generation 2 debate, and the Generation 2 would have been defined by uh, privacy features, right? Bitcoin is the Gen 1, where there is no real privacy, everything is transparent, and then Gen 2 would have some sort of shielded addresses or shielded transactions, right? So we can kind of think about it in different ways. And there's uh, different things you could think about also, right? We could maybe also imagine another universe where governance was considered the generation, right? Gen 1 is Bitcoin with no governance. Gen 2 is maybe something like Ethereum, maybe where they have some sort of uh, governance model that's not really well defined and they're, you know, actively working to find out what's the best way to do uh, governance either on-chain or off-chain. And then you can maybe think of Gen 3 blockchains as being a generation with a well-defined governance system with real proposals and predefined manner that get funding and this kind of stuff. So we can think about these different uh, universes where the terminology would have been pointed towards different uh, tracks of innovation.